Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hi Umberto, twice in one day again. <laughs> and Joanna, hello. Hi, we'll just give it a few minutes to let everyone in. I can see Claude is joining as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Just in the meantime, if you haven't already, please update your Zoom name to show your name and company so that we can send you a DocuSign. Yeah. Hi, Gemma. Just give it a few more minutes. We've got some people joining, but welcome to our second workshop and the Raising Funds and Finance module. Fabulous. Okay, I think I'll make a start. Um, welcome everyone today again, as I said, to um, our workshop in our Raising Funds and Finance module. And today we're looking at understanding venture capital and funding for growth. So today we're going to investigate the various funding options and strategies at the early and growth stages. Today, we will provide investor mindset and how they can make investor decisions. We'll look at the venture capital ecosystem and how to navigate it as an early stage founder. And we'll also look at how to understand when and how debt can support growth and what fund founders should consider. So obviously I've gone through a bit of housekeeping just to update your names, yeah. to your name and company. Um, and I'm gonna be handing over to Flavia, who is the chief commercial officer officer at Velocity Juice and Flavia will be delivering our workshop today. So Flavia, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Amazing, thank you very much. Um, I guess by now, quite a few people would have already attended and would have learned the sort of basics. So I'm just gonna offer you in today's session for the next hour, uh, a little bit of an insight into one of the parts of the process of how do you scale and how do you use capital in the most optimal way so i'm just gonna start with a little bit about myself before i was uh, on the operating side i have spent 10 years on the investment side with three funds and been very fortunate to work with companies like curve memgraph ably cognizant rails bank um and of quite a few others um across the board, so very agnostic. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed and then going to Silicon Valley Bank and seeing companies making the transition from Europe to the US was that actually that transition requires a very complicated skill set for um, which founders at least in Europe might not necessarily have um, at, from the get-go. So I've designed my own workshop this is a, what I would call a teaser, uh, many more to come. Um, so stay, stay tuned uh, outside, of course, outside Velocity Juice and outside my, um, my engagement. So I just wanna make sure that you all understand a little bit about uh, the session. So we're gonna look at some of the debt solution. There's quite a lot of emphasis. You would have seen in the last few months, quite a few articles and this week, you know, British Business Bank being absolutely battered with uh, article after article about what, uh, what they've done during the COVID period. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about three solutions which every founder at the beginning of the journey, you should be aware of. And then I'm gonna tell you how it all fits together because you need to understand how to think about your journey and how potentially you are gonna be bringing that capital that you require to get the company from where it is now to maybe 50, 100, 200 million euros or dollars or pounds um, in revenue. So the story of how everything fits together is very important. And you should be, um, you should understand that the planning happens now and you just evolve with your plan um, as you grow and as your performance reaches new and new milestones. So, and then we're gonna look at some of the key, um, let's say um, difficult elements, which 
I think that very few founders, unless you come from a finance world or an investment background, might not necessarily pick up on them. Um, and I think that they are very simple to understand once you had uh, um, a look at them and you had someone explaining. So I'm going to start with why you should potentially pay attention because when fa things fail to work, um, there are a few things that happen in companies. You fail to achieve your business goals, whether that is revenue or whether that is an expansion exercise, building and having enough funds for your R&D. So capital is very important to your business. Um, and more so, they fail because you don't necessarily need to need understand how to align your cash flow with what you really um, what your business or how you operate like so understanding your cash flow and aligning it very well sometimes is, is key and as we go into a potentially a recession in the next 12 months I think it's often so much more important to have cash and to be able to survive than potentially uh, have growth at any cost Although some of you may disagree with me, um, I do appreciate. I, I, I am, as I get older and older, a little bit more conventional. And I think it is about survival and business is building a very sustainable business that is going to be here for the next 10, 20 years. But that is just my vision. Others may completely come from a different angle. Um, and then things fail to, to work very well for you guys because you don't understand how, how much capital costs. So the pricing of the capital that you bring in, it's still an enigma to you. And you'll be surprised how many founders, um, the percentage that actually don't understand why they have to think about the cost of capital um, and pricing, not just for debt, but for equity as well. Um, and then... Potentially, when you get capital in a company, it is a little bit too much management. So you could get very frustrated. You could spend quite a disproportionate amount of your, your time uh, actually reporting to the people and the organizations or the funds that have backed you. Um, so sometimes things fail for very, very bad reasons. And when they do, it means that you either, you know, default, you potentially have to restructure the company, you might have to close the company. And that is the ultimate um, type of, um, of failed scenario that you could potentially have. And unfortunately, quite a, a large number of companies um, go through this around, I would say, 90% of SMEs will we'll go through this in the in the first five years of uh, their life cycle. So let's start with the very few solutions which are specifically designed um, in our ecosystem to cater for high growth of to some extent VC back but not necessarily um, but the high growth space so the innovation space venture debt is one of them and one of the things that you should remember about venture debt is VC dependency I will explain a little bit later what it means the second um, product that you have to uh, know, and I think it's very good for you to have a very good grasp of, is revenue-based lending. You would have probably seen it. It's everywhere. Um, it has its benefits. It's a very good product. It's been around for quite a long time, but it has its caveats. And if you don't understand how to position it, and if you don't understand the cash flow movements intuitively, it could potentially put your company in a very tricky situation. The same applies with all of the products. So there's not one perfect. Um, and then you have revolving credit. And this is... Um, potentially a slightly more complicated solution that most uh, established companies would use. However, if it's structured in the right way, it can absolutely be deployed for very specific purposes and it can enable a company to transition from one specific uh, revenue point to the next a lot faster. So all of these solutions have been um, absolutely um, inundating our market and it will continue to do so. It's a very large gap of capital just in the UK alone. Um, the type of the finance gap is growing to around 50 billion um, and it will continue to do so 
uh, throughout the recession period. So it's something that you might necessarily be confronted even if you don't want to, because funding, funding for equity is gonna be slightly more difficult. So you're gonna have to think about the the way in which you're going to capitalize your company to sustain activity. Okay, so we're going to move to the to the first one. But before we do, if you have any questions and if you want to participate, um, I am uh, I run a very democratic approach. You can just unmute yourself um, and ask your question. I think if you think of a question, there will be other companies and other founders that have the same um, the same idea, or maybe they're too shy. So please do um, um, unmute yourself. Unfortunately, I just have my screen in front of me. So if you're putting a question, yeah, I might not necessarily see it straight away. Um, Okay, so Venture Dead. Um, there are a few characteristics uh, of Venture Dead, and we're going to go through in a second. But just as a very intuitive level, it is a um, facility where you're able to um, attract quite a bit of capital, up to 30% of your equity round. Usually, it's deployed around Series A, Bs, and Cs. So if you're raising right now or you're planning over the next few months, um, a, a funding round, A, B, or C, um, then you potentially you're going to have to um, you you're going to have an ability to extend the capital that is in in your round by adding venture debt. Venture debt is to some um, to to you know very simplistically a term loan. So let's say you're raising ten million pounds, you're able to get three million into your bank account that will enable you to accelerate your runway, do quite a lot of things with an additional three million. So. Um, in terms of cash flow, if you're thinking very intuitively, the following um, happens. So you will get your facility, let's say you get your 3 million in a bank account, and then potentially you're going to have um, a structure that allows you to pay no interest or only interest. And most importantly, um, this period can be anything from three months to 12 months. So you're already in a very good position to run your, you know, to run your exercises. Maybe you want to bring a new product to the market. Maybe you haven't raised enough capital in the round and you want to be able to supplement it with, with that. So there are many reasons why companies do it. And actually in the US, most companies announce their A's and B's and C's um, inclusive of venture debt because it's almost, um, it's almost nonsensical not to get it if you are VC backed. Um, and then once you have this period of no interest or maybe only interest, you're starting to amortize it in the same way you and I would amortize a loan for a car or maybe some other item that we financed. So you can see that it's not particularly difficult to understand. Um, it's actually quite a simple product from the way it operates. The only quirk it has is that it really very much dependent on the pedigree of the VC fund. The vast majority of companies, even at series A, Bs and Cs are loss making. So thus it is almost impossible to put something like this in a company that doesn't have a very well established um, VC investor behind it. Um, this is potentially the multi-fund VCs. So not necessarily the very early stage ones. Um, and as we're as we're kind of progressing with the with um, with this particular product, one of the things that is very important for you guys now, if you're you're looking at the market, um, it's very you know it's very affordable. It can be anything from. I would say probably more like 8% today, uh, maybe all the way to kind of 20% in terms of interest rates. So it is potentially a very good product if you're thinking in relationship to the cost of bringing equity in. 
Um, it is very much dependent on security arrangements. So the fund that backs you with venture debt, um, in some cases, is going to have security over all the assets of the company. Um, and it is very expensive to set it up. So you can have a setup fee between 1% and 2%. It has an exit fee. And it potentially can cost you quite a lot to set it up um, in terms of legal. Um, so from that perspective, it's a very good product because it enables enables you to extend your funding round quite quite a lot, but um, it, uh, it does have some quirks. So it doesn't necessarily work before you reach Series A and you have a very established fund in your company. Um, okay, so let's move to the next one. So revenue base, you probably would have already experienced it, seen it, used it. It's something very simple. Um, you're able to um, attract maybe one and a half to maybe three times your monthly revenues. Um, in some cases where you're VC back, maybe you are able to access a little bit more. So it's a very good product for short term. Um, it's structured so that when you, let's say, draw down a hundred thousand pounds, the fixed fee that is accumulated, it's added on top on day one. And then because you're paying back out of a percentage of your revenue, potentially on a daily basis or weekly basis, or however it's structured, depending on the provider, um, you are gonna start to cut into um, your revenue. So the 20, 30, 10%, whatever it is, is gonna start to go away straight away. So from that perspective, from a cash flow, you already have to be very um, aware of how much it can impact your contribution towards operation. And of course, if you want to drive towards profitability, how much it can impact that. So having 25% um, layered off the top can have quite a detrimental impact on your ability to sustain. So if you are well-funded, then potentially it's near here or there. But fundamentally, this type of products have been created to enable you to pay back in a very short window of time. Um, so that means um, within the th three to four months, that is how vast majority of providers in our market operate. You should be in a position, due to the fact that you're growing, your revenues are growing, um, you should be able to repay back quite a vast, quite a quite a substantial amount of your um, your facility, which means that by kind of um, month three, you would have already been um, very much there. So whatever is left afterwards, I would consider a residual payment because it's not a substantial. You would have paid out of the immediate growth that you would have been able to add to your revenues, and that's the purpose of this type of product to help you in a short run to be able to do something that is very, very um, time sensitive and they're very quick solutions to access. They're very beneficial for the purpose that they've been intended. Um, so if you're looking at um, amortization, so this is the, um, you know, you actually have to pay back straight away. Um, it's a form of percentage of your revenue, anywhere between 10% and 35%, so it can be quite substantial. Um, if you're not very well capitalized, it can have quite a, you know, quite a detrimental impact on your performance uh, or your cash. So you could find yourself in a very difficult situation. Um, in terms of fees, actually, the fixed fee is not a reflection of the interest rate. Interest rate, unfortunately, is the true uh, cost of capital, and it can be anywhere between 18% annualized, maybe all the way to kind of 40, 50%. Actually, the faster you grow, the faster you pay back, the, the, actually the, the higher the cost on an annualized basis. So if you continue to draw down at the end of each of these cycles, apply for another one and another one, it's an awfully expensive form of financing a company. Although it is very easy to access, it's almost embedded in our, so many platforms. So you can have quite an ease getting this sort of short-term facility and it can help you exactly when you need it. So um, in terms of 
amount of quantum, different organizations provide different things. It's very, you know, it's anything from one and a half, maybe two, three percent, three times your monthly revenues. It can be, you know, it can be amortized straight away. In some cases, it can be deferred, uh, but potentially priced very differently. Um, so you can, you know, you can explore different solutions as and when you need them. But do be mindful that if you're going to grow or if you're going to, you if you're not going to grow, it can have quite a detrimental impact in your ability to pay your salaries, your overheads and everything. Um, which brings me to the third solution. Um, and this is revolving credit. It's a solution that, you know, you and I would use on a daily basis. It's just coming to the market um, very recently. There are a, a handful of providers. Um, and this is really credit lines that enable you as a company to structure and do things in a, you know, to do them is like having multiple loans. Um, so you and I would use a credit card. It's just each time we draw down, something happens. It's like a mini loan in itself. So this is what a, a revolving credit looks like. You're able to have a big pot of money. Um, let's say in this case, you are able to access a million pounds uh, credit facility. So you're not going to draw down all of that, you're probably going to be very mindful of the cost of capital. So what you're going to do is you're going to split it down and maybe align it to your growth, um, or maybe you align it to your business plan, to specific projects that you want to be able to deliver. And you're going to have a one by one drawdown by drawdown approach. So in this particular case, each drawdown operates like a mini loan. So Let's take here an example, drawdown number one. It can take anywhere between three to six months or 12 months to repay it back. In some cases, it's amortized straight away. So let's say I draw down 100,000 and then I pay um, you know, a percentage of that each month. Or maybe I just service the interest and I pay the, uh, the 100,000 right at the end by, in month 12. So it can be very useful for you, especially if you're driving revenue growth, if you're aligning to something that is very instrumental to the business and the revenue generative elements of the business. Um, and then you continue. So you have another drawdown. It can be a different amount. Um, and in month three, you can you know, potentially have another drawdown. So as a company, it can offer you quite a lot of flexibility, but this is a product that is slightly more sophisticated. So thus, it, do, it will require you to have a very good understanding of what you want to realize with the capital and how you deploy it is very important for what purpose. Um, different organizations, all the major investment banks will have something like this. Um, and of course, there are organizations, smaller funds like us, um, that focus on a specific type of pro uh, product within this range. But very much, it enables you to access a vast, you know, substantial amount of money uh, proportionate to your revenues. We can go up to 10%, in some cases, 50% or 100% of your equity round as a credit line. So it can be quite significant. Um, the reason we do that is because it doesn't sit on your balance sheet. It actually is something that you draw down and pay back and draw down and pay back. And it has a very specific purpose. In different For different providers, it can behave very differently. For the vast majority of them, it is maybe digital marketing, uh, asset finance, it could be digital asset creation, TV advertising, any type of activity or asset that is instrumental to delivering revenue growth. Um, this is what you will find even when you're a company with 50, 100 million of revenue and you're going to Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan to structure something like this for you. So from that perspective, it, it can be quite instrumental for you to understand this at the very beginning because it can save you a lot of, uh, first of all, equity raises, um, and it can save you a lot of uncertainty, especially when you don't have a lot of visibility over your cash 
cash flow moving forward. So if you're not necessarily a SaaS company um, or you're not necessarily in a business where you know how six months from now, how your revenue is going to behave and how your cash position is going to look like with any degree of certainty, it can be very instrumental because you can deploy it for a very specific purpose. Um, in terms of interest, it doesn't necessarily vary too much from other products that you might have seen in the market. It is often amortized um, uh, only by, by what you use, so you only pay for what you use. But do be mindful, different providers have a different way of looking at it. And you have to understand very well how your business operates to be in a position to work with a product like this. But once you have that certainty, you can absolutely um, increase your revenue by three, four, five, ten times in a year. And I've seen organizations uh, professionally and currently in our portfolio that have been able to deliver ten times growth in a year. It does require for you to have a very good understanding of what is revenue generative and how you unlock those specific bottlenecks. So. This is these are the three products, and most importantly, you're probably wondering um, where is this leading to, and why is it relevant? It is relevant because our market has contracted by quite a lot. Um, if you have paid attention to some of the news about venture capital, you would have seen that um, they probably estimate around thirty percent. Um, contraction. Um, what it means is that usually it's not the companies at the top that perform very well and have 20, 30, 50 million of revenue that have a challenge fundraising. It's often the companies that have very little um, and they're still kind of midway through um, the various different transitions that a company would go through. So if you happen to be in those mid points, not at series A and not at seed, um, where you have maybe raised seed at a very high valuation um, and the market has completely changed, um, then don't worry. There are many organizations exactly like you. Vast majority of organizations are in that boat right now. Um, and one of the things that is particularly unique is that fact that we, the cycles that we're growing through, they have been here for quite a long time. And it's just about managing this, you know, riding the cycle when it comes back. So the key element that I want to leave you is um, you vast majority of companies that are successfully exiting are using about 50% equity, 50% growth to get there. So there's nothing abnormal about thinking about all the solutions all the solutions you have, everything that's in your toolbox to be able to take you from where you, you are right now to the next level. Um, the challenge often is about the product and what you use it for. Um, I don't think we're in a point in our ecosystem um, and as founders with so much knowledge on our hands everywhere where you can just take capital that has no purpose. Um, it has to be very, very clear in your mind whenever you're diluting or whenever you're taking a, a particular product from the market. So I wanted to leave you with an example of a, a company that has gone through a complete cycle. And this is a real company. Um, and just to show you how it's capitalized. So if, um, if you're wondering, you know, how the best companies are able to do it, then this is a particular, particularly great example to show you the versatility and what that can really unleash for you. Um, so the company started like everybody else, raiding a seed um, around at a very early stages um, to develop the product. They have managed to test it and drive more user acquisition 
Um, as they approached seed round, they were able to uh, access um, around half a million dollars of user acquisition. This enabled them to get about Series A um, of revenue because they deployed it all into um, this kind of revenue generative activity. So they've allocated it into their uh, specific channels that were driving most of the growth. Um, in order to do that, uh, company um, absolutely needs to run a lot of um, tests in the market to understand the cost of acquisition, the lifetime value, um, understand the cycle the timing. Um, and if you're able to determine those things, then allocating capital and being very prudent with how um, it's performing for you and the return you're expecting from that capital can be um, quite significant. Um, so then they were able to raise their first, um, their, their Series A round. And alongside the Series A, it wasn't a very large one, they were able to get their first million of venture debt um, with a possibility to extend it um, at the next, uh, the next round. So they were able to allocate now a lot more capital into the um, uh, revenue generative activities. And they were able to sustain, uh, have a sustain a longer runway for quite a while. So it gave them the certainty and it enabled them to plan quite effectively and run a lot more aggressive tests in the market because they had the ability to redress if something didn't work. Um, and most importantly, as they transitioned further into kind of approaching Series B, so beyond the sort of 5 million or so of revenue, they were able to raise their, uh, their their next round and at the next round they were able to increase the venture debt now to about 20 million so you can see that a company that is fairly young um, to series a already had a couple of million of debt and now is transitioning to a completely different league and then they have 20 million dollars of of debt um, so you can understand how some companies especially in different jurisdictions uh, they're able to completely fly through in terms of revenue because they have the resources and they capitalize very differently. If the same company was raising another 22 and a half million during the same three or four years period, it would, put a, would have probably lost an opportunity to um, cannibalize the market and to go out there and uh, have that momentum. So uh, for them, financing this way made strategic sense. Um, and as they went into uh, the sort of enterprise clients, they were able to access a credit line, which enabled them to release around kind of 10 million of, of capital. So that meant whenever they, they closed a larger contract, they were able to basically um, uh, release the capital that they would get from that contract up to 10 million. Um, so it meant that the company was quite, you know, in a space of five years, already at the sort of pre-IPO um, stage, which is something that very few companies in our jurisdictions do because they're very risk averse to uh, other forms of capitalization outside um, outside uh, equity. Um, which kind of brings me to the, the, next, the next session. And this is around planning for success. I know many of you would have been completely um, overwhelmed with the, the information that I have provided you. And you're probably wondering, you know, whether these companies really do exist. I have worked firsthand with several that have managed to, to do this exercise of zero revenue to over 10 million in less than three years. Um, and I can absolutely assure you that it is, um, it is a process where both types of, of equity and debt 
are very much required. Um, but it's, you know, it's often about understanding and planning and having an ability to model how your company will behave um, a year from now and two years from now and understanding how much capital do you really need to get to 50 million of revenue at the point where naturally you would probably expect to make an exit. Um, that in itself is going to be an awful amount of money, uh, whatever you're building from medical devices to digital healthcare solutions to SaaS for, you know, enterprise in, um, I don't know, HR solutions or whatever it is, even gaming uh, and consumer products you have to be able to do this exercise and almost work backwards. I wanna to get to 50 million in five years or whatever number of years you, you're kind of deciding on and then work backwards and think about the various different products that you can put onto that journey that enable you to get to the next phase. Um, and this is where expertise and the many mentors that you can find in our ecosystem can really help um, enlighten you to what is really possible because we're in an era here in, in Europe where everything that is in the US is here as well now. So there's no issue about whether I can't access this because it's not available here as has been the case for, for you know, maybe two decades. Um, so in terms of planning for success, um, there are just a few things that I'm going to make you aware because it can be quite challenging to um, understand them. And they're oh, quite, yeah. They're, yeah, go for it. I'm so sorry. Hi, I just want to interrupt because I know you can't see the chat. We did have a question from Umberto. Umberto, do you want to unmute? And yeah, yeah, go for it. Sorry, um, I told you guys that I can't see the the chat because the the screen. Oh yeah, no worries. I had if you couldn't see. Uh, I was just curious. What was the time scale for that case study for that SAS company? Five years. Sort of five years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, um, so the journey from zero to about more than twenty million in revenue and then doubling afterwards the revenue. I, the company, you guys know it, unfortunately I can't tell you who it is. Uh, I have to be mindful, uh, but it's a company that I can absolutely assure you that you um, you will know. I have worked with them, it has been in my portfolio company. Um, so in terms, yeah, in terms of, this is absolutely doable. There are organizations that have the ability to, to navigate it this way. Um, and now I just want to uh, just want to kind of discuss a few scenarios and a few things that I would absolutely urge you as founders to pay close attention because um, they can be quite detrimental to you, whatever you do next. Um, and if you understand it, um, don't worry, uh, you're probably just going to hear something that you already know. And if you don't understand it, please do pay a little bit of attention, discuss it with your advisors, uh, do your research, uh, get comfortable with what it means in practice, not what it means on paper, um, but what does it, it, the impact it has on you personally or your company. So I'm going to start with debentures uh, and seniority. And you probably would have heard these words if you come from finance or if you, you know, just studied finance at uh, university or maybe even before that. Um, so debenture is a form of security that a lender or a fund can have over you. Um, often what you find is that um, it prohibits you from getting any other type of debt in the company. So um, venture debt providers will have that um, very sophisticated, um, you know, investment banks and very large commercial banks will have that. So this is absolutely fine if you're putting a facility that is, uh, you know, a million plus into your company. It's quite reasonable for that lender to expect to have, uh, if the company was to go bust, to have the first priority in whatever assets, uh, whatever value is remaining in the company. So the lender will get first paid and then if there's anything else, it will be distributed to um, anyone in the company. So from that perspective, um, there are different forms 
and there are different uh, conditions that can be attached. Don't assume that the way Barclays would do it is the way Morgan Stanley would or Silicon Valley or Creos or Columbia Lake Partners would do it. Um, and if you're heading into the US market, um, if naturally your, you know, your plan, your strategy takes you to the US, then please do be aware that there's, um, you know, you multiply by a factor of 10, the number Number of options and quirks that you have in each different state. Um, usually, the benches they get registered with the um, either the company's house or the commercial registry, or in some cases in Europe to the courts. Um, and they basically are very you know the last form of of control over a company. Uh, always be mindful who you give that right to. So if it's a significant facility that absolutely transform your business you're um, taking a lot of capital from that company so naturally there's a, a, a little bit of very high risk then please do consider it and always have a solicitor independent um, of your company or the fund or the institution that you liaise with to advise you um, i cannot urge you enough the devil is always in the maybe 50, 100, 200 pages. And if you're not a lawyer by trade or you haven't spent like myself six years qualifying, um, then you're probably going to have some challenges. Even I do. Um, and I have been in this space for quite a number of years. And sometimes it is so uniquely drafted that it can be quite difficult to understand what would happen in a specific situation. Um, and then you have personal guarantees and personal assets. Um, as you probably would have been aware throughout the COVID lockdown, there was there were quite a few programs by British Business Bank, and you would have maybe applied to some of the programs for financing organizations. Those of you that actually had over 250,000 loans um, would have probably noticed a bit of documentation that has been handed over to you by your bank or your fund, um, saying something around the lines of, if let's say your company was to go insolvent or into administration and the assets remaining in the company were not sufficient, that assets of the owners uh, of the business or maybe a director, usually the founder or the founders, um, would compensate with their own personal assets. Um, sometimes this is very tricky because you're not able to understand that that is a guarantee. Um, I like to believe that the largest of organizations will have a very dedicated document that is an actual personal guarantee. And the personal guarantee um, refers to the performance of the loan. So the company, if the company defaults, then you are personally with your own capital going to make good on the debt that the company has to that specific fund or that specific lender. Um, there have been a number of funds in the market that have requested this. Um, I have um, had the experience of um, working with one of them firsthand and it is very tricky. Um, so you need to understand that if your company went under, you personally, any asset you have um, in your name, it's gonna enter into the pot. And if you don't have any asset, let's say that you're in that situation, then potentially you're gonna you're not gonna be able to get rid of that debt in the same way you would if you were um, if it was a personal debt. So it's a little bit more complicated, and it can take quite a number of years. So do be mindful whenever you're signing something or whenever you're taking a, a, a type of finance for your company. Uh, what does it mean? Um, and don't be the you know don't be uh, misled by the terminology. Uh, sometimes it doesn't say that it's a personal guarantee. It's it just operates as one. Um, and most importantly, um, be mindful that even the most exciting and founder friendly funds in our ecosystem are probably going to require some security because they know that you are very early in your journey, uh, especially venture debt. 
providers that are very specialized. They do the same assessments as VCs and some of them are actually VCs. So we have VC arm and we have a debt arm. And one of the things that you will probably notice every now and again, when you're, um, when you're being given quite a substantial amount of capital is that the security is over the IP. Um, so you're not gonna be able to restructure something um, or you're not going to be able to sell the company or any part of the company um, because the lender or the fund that you have taken capital from has a security. So basically, um, it needs to make uh, to be made good in order for them to give you the consent and allow you to do that. Um, and that is, you know, that those are sort of sort of the situations that you potentially will will find. Um, as you go out there and you start to have many discussions with specialized organizations in this space. Um, but a few things for everyone. I think that the most important uh, element there is always try to model the purpose of the fund and the ROI. If you can't do that in an Excel, in a Google sheet, in, on a piece of paper, um, I think that that is where you have potentially a problem. Um, and what I would urge everyone to consider is just think about the life cycle of a company that is VC backed. Think about the inflection points that you have to go through. Think about the fact that you have told your investors at every meeting that you're driving towards 100 million revenue, 50 million, 75 million, 68 million uh, by year five. So whatever situation you find yourself into, now is the time to really kind of pay attention because the market is becoming more difficult and you need to be able to execute more than you're able to present strategy. Um, so as you're thinking about your growth and your go to market and the salespeople and all the things that you're going to do in the market, I think it's often very important to think about the way in which you're going to bring the capital to get there. And the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be um, all equity. The most successful companies have been funded 50-50. So you wanting to drive towards 100% might not necessarily be great not for you in terms of ownership that you can retain. Um, so if I was in anyone's position and how I work with companies with um, European Commission and, and beyond um, is by drawing the line to where you wanna be um, and the resources that are required and working backwards um, and trying to com completely recalibrate with your technical people, your CTO, your head of sales, um, your marketing lead, your agency, and start to feed that reality into, uh, into your models. And the moment that you have a benchmark to how am I selling, how long it takes me, how much revenue do I get from each client, from each user, um, from each customer, customer to be able to start to make it programmatic. Um, the more you're driving towards that, the easier it will be for you to execute it. And the best companies in, in our ecosystem and beyond, they have this approach from day one. Um, they're very, very focused. And many of them have gone for this journey maybe it's once or twice before, all the way to the exit. And that's how they approach it each time they start again. Um, so I, if I was in your position, I would try to break down my journeys. I would try to break down the type of funding, then start to think about how would I be able to be more efficient from a capital perspective? How would I be able to, if I had a million of, let's say, venture debt, what would I do different? Is there a different scenario that I can execute? Can I get the revenue from 5 million to 10 million in a year rather than two years? Um, and that would be one of the, you know, the questions that come out of those exercises that are very valuable because they can be quite transformative. And once you do it, I can absolutely guarantee that you won't be able to do the old classic way of I just need five million, but I don't need but I don't necessarily know why. Um, you're never going to be able to do those exercises again. And actually, you will understand how detrimental it is 
to you as a founder to go in an investor meeting and not have a very good story of how you're going to execute the route to 50, 160 million of revenue uh, in year five or seven or six, whatever it is you're telling them. Um, so that's that's kind of all for me. I know it was uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of kind of um, blabbing. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be more than than happy to answer them and to help you guys um, clarify anything. Thank you so much, Flavia. Just while we are waiting on questions, I'm going to ask Will to launch the feedback poll just so we can hear your guys' thoughts. But we do have a lot of time. So if you guys have any comments, questions, case studies, feel free to share. Give you guys a little time to have a think. We will also be sharing the slides after the session as well. No? Okay, we're going once, going twice. Don't worry, you guys. Uh, oh, I see Karen on me. Hi, Hi Flavia, Karen. Karen from Elementary B. Just um, a lot of food for thought. Certainly had not seen, you know, especially the um, the debt side as a as a very strong opportunity for us in the future. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, it might not necessarily be for anyone, or it might just kick in at a particular point. I am mindful that you are SaaS for enterprise, but I'm, you know, I'm not mind, you know, I'm not completely blind here. The moment that you have a contract with, let's say, a very large bank, um, it, you could see that uh, an accounts receivable line or a revolving credit line with uh, a fund that is structured in a way that your company operates can be quite interesting because you can release quite a lot of that value and reinvest it and hire more people and do more things. Um, and between each funding round, be a lot more efficient. Um, yeah. and, that, and that's something that often it's, it's a little bit more, more difficult to execute as a SaaS company, but there's, there's solutions like Pipe and CapChase and, and many other funds that are specialized might not necessarily be as visible in the ecosystem, but they definitely exist. Okay, no, very, very useful. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. If there are no more questions, then I will end today's session nice and early for you guys. Um, thank you on behalf of the companies. Thank you so much, Flavia, for delivering no this workshop. Yeah, thank as you, I said, it was I'll very be useful. Thanks Thanks. Yeah, well, guys, if you if you have any questions or if you want to bounce ideas, um, I am you obviously will have my email and uh, you can find me on LinkedIn on pretty much anywhere. So uh, drop me a line. Thank you very much. Thanks, it's been Thanks, amazing. Flavia. Take care, guys. Have a nice evening. Thanks, Flavia. Thanks everyone. Bye. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.